Hello, everyone. We are going to continue on our study of the Gospels, the origin of the Gospels. We are making progress in Luke's Gospel. I want to go back and clarify a few, few things that are extremely important to us. And so let me find this right here. We've been looking at the synoptic problem, which is a development out of the Enlightenment period, which in my opinion is an attack on the integrity of the gospel. And if you've been paying attention all along, there's absolutely no reason for us to bow down to this Nebuchadnezzar has been created for us. So I'm going to set this up and then we're going to go back and look at some of the people that Luke knew and why it's extremely important for us to understand that. All right. All in favor in the balcony. So <clears throat> there's a book by B.H. Streeter called The Four Gospels, A Study of Origins, 1924. So almost 100 years ago, but still very influential and has impacted the conservative uh, theological camp uh, among even to this very day, <clears throat> all right? It's called uh, the four source theory or the four documents in the orig origination of the gospel. So there's, we talked about Mark and Q being per precursors to Matthew and Luke, and we've just dis disputed the Mark and priority, I think, effectively as far as I'm concerned. But the four source theory is those two sources and then Matthew and Luke have their own particular sources. So I have a chart down here of a literary relationship. So the way it is set up now, and this comes from a, a book I probably bought at a conservative source. So what it shows you is the relationships between the synoptics as it appears today. So Mark with his 661 verses gets repeated in Matthew about 90%, 97%, somewhere around there, 661 verses, 601 verses find itself in Matthew. There's a certain portion of Mark that is replicated in Luke there is common material between Matthew and Luke that they share, given the name Q for source in the German language, theological world, 235 verses. And then here's, here's the other two, is that Matthew has unique material that only he has, and Luke has material, a lot of it, 564 verses, that's a lot of personal research that Luke has done, okay? All on board for that? So this is the four source theory. One, one, two, three, four. Still very popular, still in books. You gotta study it, you gotta read it. You gotta know what Streeter's four source theory is. All right? So what Streeter says, and this is a part of the problem, ladies and gentlemen, is that as literary works, and we talked about this during the, now that Matthew's been rejected, moved to in a in the year of our Lord, 80 to 110, and Mark becomes first, then you got a 30 to 40 year period of embellishments and legends and fanciful um, mythologizing that has created gospels, which is absolutely a preposterous theory. I mean, it's in, the gospel is the same everywhere you go all over the world, or whatever time you find it. The Jesus of the epistles is the same as the Jesus of the gospels. It's the oral tradition is the same as the written tradition. All right, but they're considering literary works. <clears throat> the gospels cannot be presupposed that even the earliest documents, curious, back directly to Jesus himself. So says McKnight. So what does that mean in English? Can anybody tell me what that means? Anybody want to stab at that in the audience today? That they be saying that the, what they're saying isn't like what it would be when Jesus was there. Right? 
The Gospels, yeah, he's saying there's nothing. It cannot. The Gospels, all four of them. You cannot assume that even at the earliest possible documents would carry us back directly to Jesus himself. <laughs> so we know that the good news is all about Jesus Christ as written in the oral and tradition, in uh, oral or written tradition. So Streeter and all those who follow him, which are many and significant, you, you have to study him even to this very day if you're going to do any serious study of the New Testament. So he's got four sources, uh, Mark, Matthew, Q, and L. Okay, we saw that. But Luke told us that he had many sources, not a few. Do you think these four are many? <laughs> so the L source, Luke's unique source, would have begun as oral, wouldn't it? I mean, wouldn't they all begin as oral? Everything's oral until what? You write it down. It can't begin as written. <clears throat> and the Q source is a hypothetical puzzle. It's non-chronological. It's biblical material because it's found in the Bible. It's good stuff, right? They're just finding what Matthew and Luke share together. So there's nothing wrong with amassing that information and giving it a name. And the fact that it's found in different places in both of those show us that it didn't come as a lump sum of material. It's placed in non-chronological sequences in both of those. So it's not completely agreed that Luke used Matthew's gospel. Now there's a consensus that he used Mark. I don't mind that. Most scholars agree that Luke begins with Mark and then he has his own material that he weaves in there, redacts, edits. Redact means edits, uh, which obviously includes the stuff they call Q, okay? But in this case, it's two, right? And that is not what the Greek word for many means. So at best, Luke used Mark, whatever sources he got the Q verses from, and his own particular research. All right, with me so far? So here's the conclusion drawn by Streeter and followed by many modern source critics, even in the conservative school now, is that nothing goes back to Jesus himself. There's no, nothing goes back directly. In other words, there's, we can't be sure of anything that we read in the gospels that it actually teaches us anything about Jesus himself. Cannot be presupposed. Presuppose means to take for granted, take as a fact, assume or presume, okay? We shouldn't presume that anything in the gospels are factual. They are not an accurate rendition of the life and teaching of Jesus Christ. Luke, God bless him, little soul, all his hard work. He was mistaken. So Streeter's theory is based on a direct contradiction yeah. of Luke's opening remarks. So we have a choice to make, right? Yeah. We can believe the guy who lived in the early part of the first century, walked, talked, spoke with apostles, gathered his information from thousands and thousands of eyewitness sources, or you can believe Streeter, take your choice. Hit the street, that's all I gotta say. So according to Streeter's view, the new view, all eyewitnesses are wrong. There's nothing factual in anything that the eyewitnesses could report. Anything that's been written down as a result of eyewitness accounts is also wrong. Nothing can be trusted. Think about the fact that there's public knowledge of thousands 
and thousands of Messianic believers in Jesus who were healed by him, heard him preach, were there at the Sermon on the Mount, were there feeding the 5,000, the 4,000, were there in Jerusalem for the Passover with millions of other Jews who witnessed the, the death of Jesus Christ from the dead. All of those people are uniformly wrong. So it's even worse than that. They're not just wrong. According to Streeter, Luke has no eyewitness sources directly connected to Jesus. Right? You cannot presuppose that even the earliest documents, whether oral or written, go back to Jesus himself. You cannot presuppose that. You know why you can't presuppose that? Because he says so. Whoa, I'm all in that. Did Streeter say that? Wow. I'm, I'm on top of that one. Streeter has a change of heart right now. He can't be still alive. Yeah. Not from 1920s. Now, Streeter is typical of typical modern theological doublespeak. Okay. There is no synoptic problem if Luke is allowed to speak for himself, right? We have a choice between Streeter being right or Luke being right. What's your choice, ladies and gentlemen? Think about what Luke says. I researched this thing. Why would he go to so much trouble to lie so eloquently? There is not a more amazing piece of literature than the Gospel of Luke, ladies and gentlemen. What does he say? He says there's many, many writers, they've decided to write things down. Now, not only is there Matthew and Mark by his time, but there's other people who've written all kinds of things about Jesus. Why not? He said, Tell me why not? <laughs> Of the things that have been fulfilled, and I want us to pay attention to this word here, us, right? Luke is a part of this era, this first generation era in the foundation of Christianity. Just as those who from the beginning, can, can he actually have eyewitnesses from the very beginning? Does Luke have access to those people? He absolutely does. Who were eyewitnesses of the ministry of Jesus Christ and ministers of the word as they delivered them to who? To us. He's counting himself in as this lucky group of people who lived in such a wonderful time as to have the living apostolic voice. He's not second century. He's not Papias. Okay, he's not Irenaeus, just a martyr, Origen, Augustine. So he says, I have perfect understanding of all things from the first. Where has he been? Hey, he's got everything from the first, and he's going to write it down, or the account. Most excellent Theophilus. That you may know what? Certainty. Certainty. So people have been telling him stuff, instructing him. There are Gnostic heresies, even at this time. There's false doctrine. There's contradictions <clears throat> by the Jewish community. <clears throat> He's going to look at, I am going to dig deep in this. I'm going to research this. I'm going to go back. I'm a part of this. And I'm going to bring you what eyewitnesses have to say. Now, <clears throat> what I thought was really interesting about this is <clears throat> this book, Unbroken. If, did, you, did you read the book or watch the movie? What is it? Unbroken. It's, it's an amazing story. It's about uh, Louis Zamperini, a local yeah, guy. Okay, Remember, it's Torrance High School's uh, fo football field. It's named after Zamperini. So <clears throat> let's see what I got over here. So Louis, 
So Laura was researching for a book called Sea Biscuit. I don't know, it turned into a movie about a horse, but I, I didn't watch it. Okay. It sounds like it was a good movie. Did you watch it? Yeah, good movie. So Amazing Rider turned into a, a book. So while she was researching for Sea Biscuit, and I'll read it to you here from the book, okay, so you know. Uh, where is this? It's a conversation with Laura. So she found in one of the articles a profile of the young running uh, phenomenon named Louis Zamperini. So, okay, she, she read that, and she's researching uh, for her book, A Sea Biscuit, and Louis' name came up again. And now it's about his wartime odyssey. What happened to him when he went to World War II? Okay, so Un, Unbroken chronicles the life of, of Louis Zamperini. So he's an, he's an Olympic athlete in uh, 1936 Berlin Olympic Games, right? Which was featured, uh, what was that guy? Jesse Owens, remember? So he joined the military, his World War II plane crashed, he spent 47 days lost in the Pacific Ocean. The story is unbelievable. The amount of tenacity and, and survival and the people that were with him and shark attacks and whatnot and nearly being rescued and not being rescued. And so then after 47 days lost in the Pacific Ocean, uh, they woke up to some good news and bad news. The good news is there was a boat that discovered them. The bad news is it was Japanese, and now they're going to be POW. So then they have this unbelievable story of his trials and tribulations in the, the prisoner of war camp, okay? And the movie doesn't tell you the best part of the end of the story, but in the, PO, in the POW camp, uh, the enemy is treated... Uh, they're very treated poorly, of course, years of imprisonment in Japan. And he comes home, like many people from World War II, just traumatized by that, got into full-on alcoholic abuse, revenge uh, on the those people who just dehumanized him, particularly the leader of the POW camp, uh, which he called the bird. His marriage has fallen apart. And then Louis goes to a Billy Graham crusade and finds Jesus Christ. This is actually an amazing testimony. It's, you can get it on audio, you can listen to it, which I highly recommend you do, or read. But in the movie, it doesn't get to this point. It just tells you that this is an amazing guy who suffered so much. But the amazing thing about it is, he <clears throat> tries to go back and reconcile with the guy that tortured him <clears throat> in the POW camp. So she says, Louis' uh, story was enthralling. He, he told us of an unimaginable abuse at the hand of his captors, yet spoke without self-pity or bitterness. In fact, he was cheerful, speaking with perfect equanimity. And when he finished his story, he, she said, I only have one question, I finished his story. How are you so victimized by such monstrous men and you're not in rage, you know, express rage. He says, very simple, I forgave them. <laughs> and it was this more than anything that hooked me. How could this man forgive the unforgivable? So I set out to write Louis' autobiography, his biography, and I set out to find answers. So she says that <clears throat> she knew uh, Pacific War history fairly well, but she began researching and she got into what she called trench work, <clears throat> interviewing POWs airmen, studying statistics, squadron histories, diaries, prisoner affidavits, and other material, okay? Doesn't this sound like what Luke just told you he was doing? Now, this is even 70 years later. She's not even a part of this event, but Luke is not only researching and interviewing actual eyewitnesses of the life of Jesus Christ, but he himself is a part of that era as, as, as an author. Okay, so she spent seven years working on this book, numerable conversations in libraries, talking to people, 
And she found out some very interesting insights that when people came back from the Pacific uh, theater, no one would talk about it. So husbands would come home, fathers would come home, grandparents, you know, they just internalized this pain and suffering and no one could really understand what they're going through. And my father also was in uh, the Pacific <clears throat> and there was not one word I could ever get out of him about this. Just tell me one thing about your tenure duty in the, in the uh, Pacific. He never would say one word about it. Never say one word. Never say a word. Could not get. And she said when she got people to share, they would, even after 70 years, they just begin to weep. They just begin to cry. And then, it, then she's got testimony in here because when the book came out, people who were descendants of these World War II uh, survivors look, oh man, now I need to apologize to my dad. I need to apologize to my grandfather. You know, I didn't never realize the suffering anguish I went through. The point of this being, what if I came to her? And let's call me Streeter, okay? And I say, none of these eyewitnesses are telling the truth. None of these eyewitnesses can be counted on because it's oral tradition. Nothing that's documented about anything they said actually directly relates back to any real thing in the war effort. What would you say about that? You're out of your mind. But for some reason, with the Gospels, you can do things like that. You can just say whatever you want, wreak whatever havoc you want, and everybody just goes, oh, man, that's so beautiful. You're so smart. <clears throat> so he says there's many, right? <clears throat> Which means a relatively large quantity. Does two or three or four sound like a large quantity to you? I'm going to believe Luke. Now, to take in hand means to write something out. To set in order means to compose a report, to organize your items, a narrative, a declaration. So many have taken in hand to set in order an orderly account, okay? It means to write in detail. Why not? He's gone from the very beginning, absolute beginning of things, okay? That's what beginning means. Eyewitnesses, what does that mean? Seen with your own eyes. These are ministers, officers, servants, anyone who serves, okay? And they've given it to us. They passed on tradition. So Luke is not only receiving tradition, gospel tradition that's been passed on, but he is a living witness himself, all right, of the best kind. So he's got <clears throat> everything from the very beginning to make a full knowledge, to make it fully known. He understands everything from the very beginning, from the very top, any, all, ever, whatsoever. He understands it perfectly, accurately, and diligently, all right? So when you, you look at uh, what Laura has done here in her book, Unbroken, highly recommend it, is she's done so much research that there's no one going to come back and find any fault with any of this unless you got a problem with history. Now, here's one of the interesting words we want to focus on just for a second. Is he calls Theophilus excellent, most excellent, okay? Most excellent Theophilus. And we'll talk more about this as we get deeper into this. But it means a lot of things. Dignity, very honorable, whoops. Strongest, noble. But it also has to do with a title. Okay, most excellent. It's a title. All right, let's see if I can find that for you. Uh, this one maybe. So here's the word, the Greek word right here, transliterated for us into the English script. 
Now, <clears throat> it's used four times in the New Testament. I think it's used only by Luke. Looks that way. So each time that Luke uses it, it is for a ruling magistrate with judicial powers. Okay, that's important. Okay, it's Luke. It's in Luke one, verses one to four. Most excellent Theophilus. Okay. Now, when we see this letter from Claudius, he calls the governor Felix most excellent. He's the same exact word. He is the governor, Roman, Roman representative, the Roman magistrate, Acts 23. In Acts 24, Felix takes over Paul's case. These are all people that are in charge of Paul's trial for the two years that he's in uh, Palestine and in Caesarea. He is also a most noble Felix, okay? And the guy that uh, follows up from Felix most noble Festus, okay? <clears throat> so in every one of these cases, <clears throat> Luke uses this word, and he's the only one that uses it. It's always in relation to someone in a government position of authority, all right? Mm -hmm. This is why I think partly the gospel of Luke and Acts were written as an apologetic for Paul's criminal case, all right? Okay, let's go back up a little bit, shall we? To about here. Last <clears throat> session, we looked at the we sections, remember? Because we wanted to see where Luke came into the picture and the people he knew. So it's not that Luke has one source or two sources, but he's deeply embedded in this whole thing. So on the second missionary journey, that's where Luke, Paul picks up Luke, and he picks up Timothy, and Luke meets Silas, who was there at the Acts 15 Council, which was an important pivot point in the history of the global movement of Christianity, which set it free from Judaism. Gentiles could be saved without keeping the law of Moses, just a few small things for hospitality reasons. But yeah, Moses, the law, superseded by the coming of Jesus Christ. So he joins them. They drop him off at Philippi, and then we don't meet him up again until his third missionary journey, okay? He joins them back up again at Philippi. And then I want you to see some of the people that are traveling, people traveling with him and with eventually with Paul. You can look all these people up. One, two, three, four. Timothy, of course, we know him. He went on to be an amazing pastor. Paul wrote a couple of epistles to him. Uh, Tychicus, uh, Trophimus, who was one of the problems that was in Jerusalem when they finally got there because they thought they brought him into the temple area and he's an uncircumcised Greek. They're all from Asia. So they went on ahead and waited for us okay back in this we board the ship at philippi and we're going to go to macedonia going to troas we stayed a week they keep going on and they met us so we we were going to take paul on just want to review this quickly there's an us there uh, we set sail all right let's see let's see if i have it down here ladies and gentlemen uh, where, oh, where is my little map gone? So here's, here's Paul's third missionary journey. He goes up through his hometown of Tarsus, which is, as far as we can tell, Paul never wrote a letter to anyone in Tarsus. He didn't f start any churches in Tarsus, which is his hometown. Scripture says you're not without honor except in your own hometown, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the first missionary journey took him in this area here. So he's going back. He's going to Troas again over to Philippi. He picks uh, Luke up again. They come back. They're journeying down. They're going to end up at Ephesus. And then they begin this long journey 
all the way down Cyprus, Tyre, Ptolemais, Caesarea, and Jerusalem. Okay? You have a picture of that in your head? And then they got the long journey, 59 to 60. So this one here is what, 53, 57, maybe 54, 58, you know, give or take. What are you going to say? So they are going to do this journey back to Rome and get washed up in the big storm, remember, and bump into this little tiny island in the middle and make their way back up. All right, those are the last two journeys that we know of. So if we go back to here, now you can see where some of these places are on the map. Asos, Miletus, and they, they're going to sail past Ephesus. He wants to be in Jerusalem by the day of Pentecost. Okay, so he's kind of in a hurry. <sighs> We looked at the journey. He ends up uh, in all these areas, Caesarea, Tyre, Jerusalem, okay? Uh, Syria, Tyre, Tyre. So at Tyre, they went to Ptolemaeus. I don't know how to pronounce that. Maybe that's right. There's brothers there, okay? Then they got to Caesarea, and there's Philip the Evangelist, one of the sevens, okay? He has four unmarried daughters who prophesied, so... They stayed with Philip, the evangelist, and his family for a number of days. That's amazing Christian hospitality. There's a lot of people traveling with Paul right now. You know, I can see him sleeping on the floor somewhere, okay? It's a mission trip, Paul's missionary trip, crashing Philip's house in Caesarea. And he's got daughters in there, right? Prophesying over everybody. Can you imagine them? Wow, how awesome is that? Four daughters, young girls, unmarried, right? Who prophesied, I don't know, maybe something good happened with all these men traveling with them. Yeah. You know? Maybe Timothy, you know, can find, get lucky. Find himself a good wife. <clears throat> so then they go, to, they go to Jerusalem. Disciples from Caesarea, us, brought us to the house of Nason. He's a man from Cyprus, one of the early disciples, okay? Early disciples. Jerusalem, got there. So who does Luke know? He knows Paul, he knows Silas, Timothy, all of these guys. Aristarchus is, you know, big shot. There's more stuff about him in the commentaries. Tychicus, Trophimus. And Ephesus, he met the elders that were appointed in Ephesus. There's disciples in Tyre. And Ptolemaeus, then he stayed in Caesarea with Philip the Evangelist and his family. And he met Agabus there, remember the prophet from Jerusalem. And where is this? And Nason. An early disciple from Cyprus. Okay, now let's just look at a couple of who these people are. So Agabus is mentioned as a prophet in Acts eleven twenty eight, and he was the one that predicted the famine, all right, the, the famine prediction that happened in the fourth year of Claudius. And that's why they took up an offering to take down to Jerusalem. It was a famine relief offering at the end of Acts chapter 11. Don't make me have to turn there, all right? So... Traditionally, he's considered to be one of the 72 disciples. Remember that Jesus commissioned to preach the gospel. In Luke chapter 1, it's 70 disciples, 70, 72. Sent them out two by two to preach, right? You familiar with that? And it also is said in tradition that Agabus was with the 12 apostles in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. Why not? You know? So when they arrived at Caesarea, Agabus is the guy that predicted that Paul would be taken captive. He put his belt on him and tied him up and said, this is what's going to happen to you if you go to Jerusalem. They tried to talk him out of it. But Paul says, no, I'm willing to go and die in Jerusalem for the Lord Jesus. Anybody remember that? Mm -hmm. All right. And then, of course, Agabus was among the martyrs who suffered for Christ in Antioch. 
So who's Agabus? Agabus is a very core person, very early first century, involved in the Antioch church from the very beginning and continued to be faithful for, for decades after that, was remained in Paul's circle of friends. This is one of the people that Luke met and has his testimony, has his words recorded in Acts of the Apostles, all right? How do we have the words of Agabus? Is because Luke interviewed him, was there personally, and wrote those words down, all right? Now, we skipped over Philip a little bit last week, but Philip is an amazing guy. Back in Acts 6, how early is that? <laughs> That's early on in the life of the, the church, right? Acts 2 is Pentecost. Acts 3 is a gate beautiful. The trial in 4, 5 is all the healings that take place. Acts 6 is the problem that arises with all these people getting saved. There's Greek-speaking widows who are complaining that the Hebrew believers, uh, because their widows are not getting enough food in the daily distribution. So you have the Greek-speaking widows, you have the uh, Hebrew-speaking widows who are getting better treatment than the foreigners. So the 12, who's the 12? Who's the 12? 12 apostles, okay? So 12 apostles call us meeting of everybody. Okay, we got a big, got a big meeting going on. We have to resolve this issue. You know, our job as apostles is to teach the word of God, not running a food program. Now, they're not being big shots. They're not saying that's below us. But this is how the church is supposed to function. People have gifts and people have positions that they're supposed to function in those. And he says, if, if we do this, then we're not going to be able to fulfill the responsibilities that God has given to us. So, therefore, there must be people in the congregation that are suited for this this ministry. So look at what I want. I want people that are well respected, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Okay. Pretty high credentials. Okay. And so in this group of seven that are put forth, there's Stephen and Philip is one of them. This is the same Philip. Okay. Yeah. So how early is Philip? What does Philip know? Is Philip an eyewitness of anything? Only everything. And there's nothing to say that he wasn't a disciple of Jesus Christ prior to this. Because he's a, instantly in leadership in this core group. Okay, he's second level leadership under the apostles. So there's, there's no, and Stephen's theology is impeccable. Because you remember in Acts 7 when Stephen is arrested and and there's capital punishment, and who's who's standing with them? Paul is there, right? Who's we call him Saul. So in Acts seven, we have another court case. Stephen defends himself. They go crazy. They kill him. Saul is standing there, one of the witnesses. Who could be a source for that? Paul himself is a source of that, right? Paul has to be a source. Do you think Paul forgot what Stephen prayed? Do you think Saul's the only guy there or there's, you know, 100 Christians standing around? There's a lot of Christians right there. Mm -hmm. We think Philip is watching his friend, you know, being killed. So this is firsthand eyewitness testimony of events that, that occurred very early on. And then Philip, as we know, after the persecution broke out over this, he went to Samaria and there's a huge revival there. Anybody remember that? And then they got the, the showdown with, with Simon the magician and they sent Peter and John over to lay hands on them so they could be filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So Philip has all kinds of information about everything that took place in Samaria. Okay, That's where you get this. He's an eyewitness. And then I love this story in Acts 8 where an angel tells him to go to the Gaza Strip and he finds the Ethiopian eunuch reading, just by chance, reading the, the book of Isaiah, right? What are the chances of that happening? You think that's a divine appointment? Yes. This is really the first Gentile convert. So 
Philip is very influential. Philip is an amazing guy. Luke has information from, from Philip. Okay. So when Streeter comes out and says there's no documentation or no legitimate direct contact with not only the earliest documents, but also the earliest disciples, many of whom were disciples of Jesus Christ. How can people believe that? So Paul stayed at, at Nason's house and they called him an early disciple. So what does that mean when you're giving him the special attention as being one of the early disciples? Okay, so this is like 56 or so, right? 57. So they're thinking that he was converted by the day of Pentecost. Now, it's interesting, he's also a native of Cyprus and could have been acquainted with Barnabas, who's also from Cyprus. It's interesting that it was some of the believers from Cyprus who began to preach the gospel to the Gentiles about the Lord Jesus. And the power of the Lord was with them, and a large number of these Gentiles came to the Lord. All right. It could very well be that Nason was one of these disciples from Cyprus who were the, the early crossover preachers who brought the gospel of Gentiles and really was a, a spearhead of the Gentile inclusion movement. All right. Who does Luke know? A lot of people. A lot of good sources, right? You think you think this early disciple knows anything? You think Luke sat down with him and interviewed him and got some conversation with him, staying at his house? Luke's got paper. He's got papyrus. He's he's in the trenches researching. What a what a trove of Early information. How amazing is that? So now they leave Caesarea. They're going with Paul. They're going on foot, 65 miles, at least three days by foot. Can you imagine at least three days? I'm saying even more than that. Take your time, guys. Don't be in a hurry. It's blistering heat. You know what I'm saying? Relax. Take it easy. What are you going to do? 20 some miles a day? Have you ever walked 20 miles in your life? Anybody? Anybody out there? We used to do 20 mile hikes in the Boy Scouts to get a badge for it. <laughs> yeah, you got a hiking mirror badge. I walk 20 miles. And just we're walking crazy people. Now, here's what I really like. Are you ready for this? We look at this, but look at it a little more deeper right now. So the next day, Acts 21, they got into town, they hooked up with Nason. And us, the rest of us, everybody went to see James. Okay? We went to see James. Now, what James is that? Anybody have a guess? Jesus' brother. Yeah. James, the apostle, was already killed in Acts chapter 12. So this is James, the half-brother of Jesus Christ. <laughs> And all the elders who were present at the time, what do they know? Are they connected in any way? Is there any information since Jesus preached in their synagogues and Jesus preached in their temple and Jesus was crucified in their, in their street? Think they don't know anything? And then he says there's thousands of Jews who believed. Thousands, thousands. What, how many are a thousand? So thousands of eyewitnesses of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. And he's there for two years while Paul is on this lengthy trial with Felix, Vextus, Agrippa, right? Now, this is not James the martyr. This is the most significant 
and primary eyewitness connection that you could possibly have with Jesus Christ. His half-brother. Did they grow up in the same house? Did they have the same mother? How could you get any more direct than that? Oh, yeah, there's there's nothing. Man. They're, they're nothing. Who, who's this guy? So Streeter says there's no sources directly related to Jesus. And Luke says he met James, the half-brother of Jesus. All he has is these little four, these four sources. Poor Luke, you just have Mark and Q and his little common material. The Q is the common material. What's Q? Common material to Matthew and Luke. Everybody got that's for the test. Luke has peculiar or unique material. That's called what? L. Matthew has unique material. What do we call that? M. Matthew, indigenous, Luke, indigenous, okay? That's the four sources. Then he says, the gospels cannot be presupposed that even the earliest documents carry us directly back to Jesus himself. So we got a problem with that, don't we? This is a huge problem. One of the problems is, is that's taken to be factual when there is no factual basis for it. It's taken by many to be substantial and ha you have to deal with Streeter. But it's like, what for? Right? W what did we just read? Luke was personally introduced to James, the top leader in the Jerusalem church. Right? So we know that Jesus' family was skeptical towards his ministry during his lifetime. How many know that? Raise your hand. Yeah. yeah, if you're the Messiah, why don't you go on, you know, the, to the Passover? No, Jesus says, no, not come later, right? And then he shows up. But after his resurrection, his family all became believers, right? Awesome. Why not? Even in the upper room on Pentecost, you got not only the apostles, right? But they had Mary, the mother of Jesus, Bless her heart. A bunch of the other woman. Oh, 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 and yeah, the brothers of Jesus. <laughs> right? Last but not least, <laughs> we'll include them. <clears throat> so the brothers of Jesus, the family of Jesus, were all disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you talk to James, you're talking to the most influential and significant connection to Jesus Christ himself. And he also, Paul also met Peter, okay? After his three years, he has conversion. He was gone for three years. He came back, Barnabas introduced him to the apostles. He says, the only apostle I met at that time was James, the Lord's brother. So very early on, James is an apostle, which means, you know, prominent leadership position in the church very early on in the first few years of the growth of Christianity. And then in 1 Corinthians 15, in terms of post-resurrection experiences, Peter, the 12, 500, most of whom are still alive, okay? So Paul says that the eyewitnesses of the resurrection are still alive. Peter is still alive. How's that not a direct source? Paul, Peter, James. Then he was seen by James. His brother James had a post-resurrection appearance from his brother in the flesh, Jesus. Can you imagine what that must have been like? <laughs> James is just blown away, right? Come on. They really picked on him. You remember him picking on him? Yeah, your mother and brothers are outside. They think you're crazy. 
When Jesus said, no, no, my mother and brothers are those who follow the word of God, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then Paul says, last of all, me. But that's not last of all, because as I said, there's many people that uh, Jesus appeared to and still appears to. So in Galatians 2, Galatians 1, he's called an apostle, James. And in Galatians 2, Paul and Barnabas come to Jerusalem and meet, who's put first here? James, Peter, and John. Now, I might put Peter, John, and James, right? These were pillars of the church. <clears throat> They're coming down with this famine relief. <clears throat> As I told you, Agabus predicted that. So they took an offering. They brought it down. Plus, there had been all kinds of misinformation about the message of Barnabas and Paul. And it says, they recognized the gift that God had given me and Barnabas. Let's not forget Barnabas in this. Paul is very self-centered right here. But Barnabas is Paul's mentor. Paul was kicked out of town after his three years. He came back. Barnabas introduced him. He caused so much trouble. They had to ship him out. Uh, Paul was gone for about 10 years. He became invisible. Nobody knows what he was doing. It doesn't help to make up stories about what he is doing. Nobody knows. Nothing significant. If Paul did one thing significant in the entire 10 years, we would know about it. Right? We knew about his one convert of Lydia in Philippi. Okay. Barnabas goes, resurrects him. After, uh, the, the, the Cyprian uh, Christians come, witness to the cross culturally to the, the Gentiles in Antioch, which is right up above. If you come up, uh, the main hub that goes into all the world from there. And they sent Barnabas up there to organize that cross cultural church because he's such a wonderful human being. And it says, um, that there was tremendous benefit from when Barnabas went there and organized. So Barnabas goes get Paul, brings him back for a year, then mentors him, and then Paul takes him on his first missionary journey. So it's called Paul's first missionary journey, which is Paul's first missionary journey. Well, it's not Barnabas' first missionary journey. Barnabas has been an apostolic uh, agent for you know 20 years by this time. All right? So... They encouraged us to keep preaching to the Gentiles and they would continue their work with the Jews. Now, it's important to see here that when Paul goes to this meeting with James, Peter, and John, that they recognized a gift and accepted them as co-workers. What would happen if they rejected Paul as a co-worker? What if they said, Paul, whatever you're preaching is not right? They would be right. Exactly. But because Paul came there and was willing to submit to their doctrinal ordination panel, they approved what Barnabas had mentored him with and what they had learned on their journeys. Okay, it's a very important meeting. So Brother James is, the, is one of the top leaders of the church in Jerusalem. He also is the author of the epistle of James in the New Testament. Jude is another half-brother, the author of the epistle of Jude. And Jesus' brothers also undertook missionary travels with their wives, as you can see here. Paul says, don't we have a right to bring our wives with us as other disciples and the Lord's brothers do? I mean, can you believe name dropping like that? <laughs> How come they get to do it and I don't? And Peter gets to, Peter does it. You know, what's, what's wrong with that? So what we see, and I think it's, it's important, personally, I'm really happy about this, is that not only is Luke deeply embedded in the very early part of the first century growth of Christianity, but he's personally acquainted with so many people. And the brother James and the Jerusalem leadership. 
And as I'm pointing out, there can be no more direct link to Jesus Christ than the brother who lived in the very home growing up with him. I don't get it, ladies and gentlemen. How is that even scholarship? How is that even scholarship? Uh, let's see. I'm looking for something here. Okay, so let's we'll end with this, shall we? Luke has unique material. What's the name for that? Very good. Give yourself a little star. So this is the L material. Okay? So I want you to see some of the stuff that he has here. Uh, he's got the entire story. Whoops. Did not touch that. Of the angel appearing to Mary, the interaction between Mary and Elizabeth, that Mary's prayer that she prayed, her song. Remember her, her Magnificat and her beautiful song? Uh, the birth of John the Baptist, all the information from Elizabeth and from John uh, Zachariah's point of view. So you get their language, you get their mind, you get their story. You're getting in their head, you're hearing it from them personally. All right. So this is called point of view. So from Luke's gospel, we get Mary's point of view. From Matthew's gospel, we get the nativity from Joseph's point of view. The angel appears to Joseph. The angel says to Joseph, the angel says, you take Mary to be your wife. Hey, Joe, you better leave town because they're going to come kill the kid, right? But in this one, Luke gets intimate information from Mary, all right? The baby leapt within her womb, okay? How much more intimate can you get than that? So the question is, where does Luke get that information? Does he make that up? He gets it from Mary. He gets it from Zachariah and Elizabeth, right? He gets it from the very people themselves telling their own story because he's in their trenches. He says, I'm researching it from the very beginning, from those who have been a part of this entire situation. Eyewitnesses passed it down to us. He's got the census. He's got the angels and the shepherds. He's got the circumcision store in the temple with Anna and uh, Simon, right? And then he's got the little family story when Mary and Joseph lost Jesus. Can you imagine? That would be kind of embarrassing even to tell that story. <laughs> we lost the Son of God <clears throat> for about five days, right? Jesus is wandering around the streets of Jerusalem, a homeless person. John the Baptist, and then Luke's got his own particular genealogy, which many think is the genealogy of Mary. Why not? Uh, the Good Samaritan, he's got the Luke chapter 10, which is the sending out of the 70, giving them power over demons. He's got special interest in Mary and Martha, which is really sweet. And he's got 15 parables on his own, okay? And he also has the two thieves on the cross, which we read recently, right? Mm -hmm. The road to Emmaus, he's got stuff. How does, how does you get that inter, intimate information about the disciples on the road to Emmaus? How does he get all those things? He's done his research. This testimony goes back to the resurrected Jesus Christ himself, okay? He's got testimony about the ascension. He's got that from those who are gathered there during the 40-day period. He's got information about what Jesus taught them during this 40 days, that he, they ate with him, they saw him, and Jesus said, don't leave Jerusalem until you receive the promise of the Father. You know, direct words to Jesus Christ, to them about their orders and what he wants them to do before he sent the sins into heaven. Then he says, 
you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you're going to be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the world until the world ends. All right? <sighs> <clears throat> okay, Luke was with Paul for two years in the Caesarean imprisonment. And during this protracted trial, again, he meets James, he meets the elders, he has two years. He's got eyewitness information from Mary, the mother of Jesus. He's got Mary's song verse Jesus. He's got background from Zachariah, as we said, all this stuff. Luke has plenty of time to collect oral and written accounts from endless witnesses, ladies and gentlemen. There's no lack of eyewitness sources. Okay, what do you say? No lack of it. And numerous written sources. It's not even a problem. And Matthew's gospel was well circulated at this time, not only in Jerusalem, but in the world. So the fact that Matthew and Luke have things in common should come as no surprise to anyone. That doesn't surprise me. Is that a problem? No, not at all. Not at all. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to end with this part right there. Okay, thank you so much for being here today. I hope this is helpful to you in some way. And may God bless you.